Appendix The Ballad of the Veliga or How the Gastropod Got Its, to its Twist The Veliga's a lively tar, the liveliest afloat. A whirling wheel on either side propels his little boat, but when the danger signal warns his bustling submarine, he stops the engine, shuts the port, and drops below unseen. He's witnessed several changes in pelagic motor craft. The first he sailed was just the tub with the tiny cabin aft. An archie mollusks fashioned it according to his kind. He'd always stowed his gills and things in the mantle sack behind. Young Archimolochus went to sea with nothing but the vellum, a sort of auto-cycling hoop instead of pram to wield them. And spinning round, they one by one acquired parental features, a shell above, a foot below, the queerest little creatures. But when by chance they brushed against their neighbors in the briny, coelenterates with stinging threads and arthropods so spiny, by one weak spot betrayed, alas, they fell an easy prey. Their soft prioral lobes in front could not be tucked away. Their feet, you see, amidships next the cuddy hole abaft, drew in at once and left their heads exposed to every shaft. So Archimolochus dwindled, dwindled, and the race was sinking fast when by the merest accident salvation came at last. A fleet of fry turned out one day, eventful in the sequel, whose left and right retractors on the two sides were unequal. Their starboard halyards fixed astern alone supplied the head, while those set a port were spread a beam and served the back instead. Pre Predaceous fours still drifting by in numbers unabated were baffled now by tactics which their dining plans frustrated. Their prey upon alarm collapsed, but promptly turned about with the tender morsel safe within and a horny foot without. This maneuver, fied Lamak, speeded up with repetition until the parts affected gained a rhythmical condition and torsion needing now no more a stimu stimulating stub will take its predetermined course in a watch glass in the lab. In this way, then, the Veligar triumphantly askew acquired his cabin forward, holding all his sailing crew, a trochosphere in armor cased, with a foot to work the hatch, and double screws to drive ahead with smartness and dispatch. But when the first new villagers came home again to shore and settled down as gastropods with mantle sack afore, the archi mollusks sought a cleft his shame and grief to hide, crunched horribly his horny teeth, gave up the ghost and died. Walter Garstang, 
1928. Recipes. The practice of preparing and eating snails has a long and noble history. We heard previously how the ancients valued land snails as a food delicacy. They would first purify the snails to render them safe for human consumption. The rule of feeding them on greenery that is non-toxic followed by a period of starvation is still adhered to so that we humans don't incur any health problems. One of the earliest recipes for eating land snails come from 14th century France and simply relies on boiling the animals or frying them with onions in oil. It wasn't until the mid 19th century that there was any significant interest shown in snails as a gastronomic item. Lovell's book, The Edible Mosques of Mollusks of Great Britain and Ireland with Recipes for Cooking Them, published in 1867, provides a useful insight into the way both land snails and sea snails were prepared for the table. He points out that while the sea always provided a rich harvest of mollusk, molluscan meat during the famine of 1816 to 17, land snails proved an invaluable source of food for the inhabitants of central France. Their shells were cracked open and they were thrown into boiling water containing herbs for just long enough to extract the snail meat. Then they were returned to the boil until cooked. From there, they were placed in a saucepan and fried with butter, garlic, parsley, and other ingredients such as thyme, bay leaves, flour, the beaten yolk of an egg, vinegar, and lemon juice. By the second half of the 18th century, snail recipes appeared in several French cookbooks. Amongst these, Escalgots à la Bourgogne proved the most popular. A modern version can be made with snails already prepared and sold in tins. Half a pound of ordinary salted butter is softened and mixed with the juice of half a lemon and some parsley. Five cloves of garlic, salt and black pepper are added and the snail butter allowed to cool in the fridge. Two dozen prepared snails are introduced, one to each shell, and snail butter is added until each shell aperture is full. An oven is preheated to 200 degrees and the filled shells cooked until the butter is seen to be sizzling on top. This can be done in special dishes with indentations or on a surface that allows the snails to remain upright and so hold onto the butter. They are served hot with crusty bread as an accompaniment. In Escalgot à la Sommeroise, entire snails are placed in a pan of boiling water with thyme, basil, a bay leaf, some pared orange, orange peel, and pork rind. They are cooked until their bodies can easily be removed from their shells and next fried in olive oil to which has been added chopped fatty bacon, ground walnuts, anchovy fillet, crushed garlic and salt and pepper. This 
mixture is thickened with flour and served on a bed of spinach. The Spanish, who are as fond of their snails as the French, have a similar recipe using different cooked meats as well as snails. Olive oil is heated in a casserole and sausages, sausage meat fried in it until golden brown. The sausage meat is set aside and in the same oil of fried in turn, bacon and cured ham, both chopped into small pieces. These two are set aside. In the oil that remains is fried garlic and onion. A sauce is made out of tomatoes and added to the pan and stirred into stirred to create a somewhat oily mixture. The cooked meats are returned to the pan after a few minutes of gentle heat and stirring. The prepared snails are added. What gives it a Spanish touch is the addition of a spicy red pepper with some seasoning. A modern day alternative uses chorizo, sausage, and spring onion. In England, consumption of land snails was more for medical purposes than as a culinary treat. The West Country, notably Bristol and the Mendips, where land snails are relatively abundant, was one area of the country where snails have long been eaten as food. They were called wallfish. Workmen would fry them on razors at the side of the road, and in the 1960s, a restaurant known as the Miner's Arms in Freddy, Somerset, attracted custom attracted custom by serving snails. Helix asparsa, much as on the continent, in shells filled with the butter contain, containing herb, but not garlic. Instead, cheddar cheese, cream, cayenne, and black pepper dill, black pepper, black pepper dill, fennel, charvil, chives, lemon balm, and lemon thyme were used. They were served hot with sliced bread and butter. For those anxious to savor snails other than in garlic sauce today, it is necessary to visit the Fat Duck restaurant at Bray. Here, Chef Heston Blumenthal has created snail porridge, his signature dish. The recipe can be found on the BBC food website. As far as sea snails are concerned, recipes have tended to emphasize the salty nature of the sea in which the creature live, rather than have it disguised with herbs and garlic. Like land snails, sea snails require cleaning using several changes of water to remove sand and mud. Weekles are usually boiled with as much as much water as as prevents them from sticking to the pan. After a short boil, they are drained, cooled under a cold tap and served with a little vinegar. A spin is used to remove each animal from its shell from and the opaculum is removed before it is eaten, usually with sliced buttered brown bread. The much larger whelk is also boiled, this time to completely remove the animal from its shell and then fried in butter until brown. Limpets and omas need to have their meat first tenderized by hammering it before frying 
in a spoon with butter. In the Welsh recipe, pastai braining, layers of cooked and tenderized limpets, fried bacon and onion are placed in a dish lined with short crust, short crust pastry covered with a plenty of covered with a pastry lid and cooked. Snail meat from whatever source is a rich source of protein and one's personal prejudices have been overcome can offer a good and healthy alternative to other meat dishes. Acknowledgements the material in this book is the result of the scholarship of others. I am indebted to all of them and to those who have variously supported, contributed, or discussed with me the content and shape of the book. Particular thanks go to my wife Eleanor for her forbearance and for seeking out snail Ephemera, ephemera to to Tom for making useful textual revisions to Lucy and Rick for their photographic assistance and to Cyan and Jim for taking the taking an amused interest in the book's gestation. Peter Bright added his considerable zoological wisdom as well as a few photographs. Julian and Helen Barker were active in seeking out snail kitsch and Je Jeffrey Holland provided information on co-write currency. Neil Riseborough discussed with me the role of snail master and Barty Lay told me about Vishnu's conch. Jane Jelly directed me to useful sources of snail imagery and Amanda Brody helped with Latin references to the snail. Ross Diamond drew Ross Diamond drew some splendid snail chocolate which sadly couldn't be included in the book. Ingrid Thomas shared her considerable library on shell imagery with me and pointed me in the direction of S. Peter Dance. Peter How Howard accompanied me to shell grottoes and the late Sir Howard Colvin supplied details of the same as well as bequeathing me as bequeathing, bequeathing me a sailor's valentine in his will. Stafford Lightman scored the summit of Kinabalu for snails and came back with a solitary slug. Thanks go to the librarians at the Linnean Society and the Zoological Society of London who gave their time and expertise seeking out relevant books and illustrations. I am particularly grateful to Jonathan Bart for sharing ideas about the book early and to to the staff at Rickton, Rickton Books, in particular Michael Lehman, Harry Gelonis, Ian Blenkinsop, and Martha J, who guided me through its production. To these and others who directly or indirectly have assisted in the production of Snail, many thanks. Any errors are entirely of my own making. Finally, Liu Thou Sen 
gave me particular joy when he named a subspecies of Bornean land snail after me, Everettia corrugata williamsi. I now have something to put on the tombstone.